this is Mandy. So I just finished day two of a lot of interviews. I think there were about 13 interviews and I wasn't the one interviewing. I was on the interview team. We're hiring different positions for our school. And whenever we have the opportunity to do that or have those positions available for uh, staff members to be on that team, I'm usually asking to be a part of it just because I think that's important. One, I want to know who's going to be entering our building and what kind of personality they have and have had a chance to meet them and see them even if they're not part of my grade level. But also I think it's always good to reflect on your own practice as a teacher and it definitely provides you the opportunity to do that. So I just finished writing an article about the do's and don'ts of interviewing, especially by using Zoom. Although uh, this article in particular um, relates to Zoom, it definitely relates to in-person. And let me tell you what, there are definitely things that you do want to do and things that you don't. And I am pretty, 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 pretty tired. Um, it was nice to be able to see all my coworkers on Zoom. Um, it was a long couple days and I arrived today thinking, okay, we're starting to interview for a whole other position today. No, it was a continuation of the same position over two days. That's how competitive things are right now. So my number one thing, don't not come prepared. In other words, double negative. Please come prepared. Don't think that you can just wing an interview because it is obvious. And even if you're interviewing in the same building where you expect to be hired, make sure that you prepare and you're over prepared. And we know that you're going to be nervous. That's natural, that's okay, um, but come prepared. And also dress appropriately. So right now I'm in a t-shirt and I've actually got my leggings on and I'm sitting crisscross applesauce and I'm, yes, I'm a kindergarten teacher so it's crisscross applesauce and I'm super, super comfortable. I've got my drink right here in case I need it. Um, and usually I put myself on mute and then I would take notes on my computer as the applicant was speaking. I cannot speak to anything individual that an applicant did, just so you know I won't be doing that. I will not be sharing names. I won't be sharing anything particular um, that would breach confidentiality. So know that coming in, but these are all experiences that I've had um, as I've been on an interview committee. So uh, throughout several years, so I'm entering in my eighth year and my goodness, my principal came up with some amazing questions that made me think, oh my gosh, would I have gotten hired if I had been on the same interview team? I mean, it is super competitive. So number one, dress appropriately. Don't dress in a t-shirt and leggings like what I'm doing. I get to do this from home, I'm volunteering. You are not, you are trying to land a job, so dress to impress. And you know what, I think it might make you feel better too. I can also tell you that experience alone doesn't mean that you're going to land a job. So the other thing I would say is don't rely on your experience to carry you through unless you can articulate it. If you can't articulate what you do well, we can't score you on that, even if we know you. And that's so that the interview process can be even Steven, okay? So that everyone can be scored adequately so and fairly. And I think that's a good thing. You should also be able to articulate your teaching practice. So I think that, at least for me, as I'm reflecting on myself, if I had been teaching for the amount of time that I've been, and I've been out of school for a while, some of those buzzwords start to either leave or you just don't speak in the same way. Um, I might wanna brush up on some of those skills before I come to an interview, which also brings me to the point that if you use acronyms or you're talking about a specific program, unless you're interviewing in the same district or the school where you did your student teaching or you've done a practicum or you've been involved, please explain what they are. There are so many teacher acronyms and programs out there. So make sure that if you use an acronym, okay, because remember we can't ask clarifying questions, okay, we're not supposed to anyway. Sometimes we do if it relates to the question, like one of the questions had to do with distance learning. If you don't know what distance learning is, you can't answer the question. So we could clarify what that term meant, but we couldn't ask clarifying questions like um, specific examples. We could say, could you elaborate on that? But we couldn't give any sort of leading questions to try to drag that out of you. That's something that you need to intrinsically have. 
So make sure that if you use acronyms or you're talking about specific programs, that you have about a sentence that describes what those things are. So in our interview process, for example, we have 10 questions and about 30 minutes per applicant, which gives you about three, three minutes per question. So also know that three minutes is a long time. Use your time. It's probably better as long as you're articulate and you know what you're talking about and you prepared ahead of time to talk more than it is to talk less. If you give us this much information, that's all we can score you on. So please elaborate on why you are perfect for that position. Brings me to another tip. Make sure you research your school ahead of time. Don't say they have a great community. Well, I hope all schools do. I know that that might not be the case, but yeah, so they have a great community. Give details, okay? So sometimes that's hard to find out on a website. Be a detective, be creative. Draw on the knowledge of the things that you've investigated on their website. Find a way to get info. And if you don't know or you weren't able to find certain information, be transparent about that, but show them that you took the effort and did the research to find out, for instance, their demographics, um, maybe their test scores, and maybe like their, um, their socioeconomic status. Those things are especially important if you're working in a high needs building or a building with low socioeconomic status because the culture of that community is going to look a lot different than another community. It's kind of like a classroom by classroom basis. That information is available through OSPI. So take the effort and figure it out. Don't ask that question at the end. Don't ask about what kind of building it is and what the demographics are like, okay? Do the research. Don't ask a question that you could figure out the answer to on your own, okay? That's just a natural thing to do. Uh, the other thing that I would say a lot of applicants would have done a lot better on, quite honestly, is if they just answered the question. So the applicants that did the best are those that had a piece of paper next to them and would jot down some answers. Some of the applicants that also did the best are ones that you could tell really knew their stuff. Like they really knew how to teach. They didn't just know the buzzwords, but it was like an intrinsic value that they had as a teacher and you could tell because of the way that it came out of their mouth. So I like to think about it the way that the Bible says that out of the, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it's something that you value and is close to you, it's going to come out during your interview process. So that's a really important thing, that the things that you value and the way that you word things um, very specifically could either rub people the wrong way or it could really promote kind of that value um, inside them and really get them excited about the possibility of you being in that position because you share a common interest or a common goal or a common um, passion when it comes to teaching such as race, uh, race ethnicity, um, culture, uh, which brings me to the point that if you're talking about race, culture, and ethnicity, um, you need to distinguish between those aspects because they are different and they are also interwoven. And so you need to talk to each of those different issues separately, but in a way that brings it back together in the end that talks about how you build that community support within your classroom. Don't say you build community support in your classroom. That doesn't share anything. <laughs> I don't know what that means. You need to be specific to how that looks for you. Um, specifically draw out maybe the behavior modification strategies, the um, classroom systems in place that are maybe building-wide or district-wide that you also do. If you're not sure what they use, go look it up. Do some of your research and draw the parallels in that you have in common and then maybe bring in a unique perspective about maybe something you do differently that has worked really well for you in the past. Also be prepared to be transparent. We know that teachers are not perfect. Um, we're going to have hard days. We're going to have children that just really know the exact button and when and how and where to push it and how you take care of those situations in a way that doesn't destroy the relationship you might have with a student or another staff member. How do you handle those situations in a way that is positive? Um, and if there is a miscommunication, how do you go about handling that in the future? So be 
thinking about being a professional. So um, not anyone can be a teacher. What makes you unique? What makes you a professional? What makes you special for that job? It also brings up the whole point. Um, look at the job application and the description because sometimes those will give you clues into the kind of position you're looking for. So if it's not part of a specific program, you should probably know that ahead of time. I'm thinking about how different schools have different programs for different grade levels and different grade bands. Um, if you're wondering if it's a continuing position or anything like that, that's probably something that you could get on the job application. So it goes back to the beginning. Don't ask a question that you could find research for and research on your own. Um, try to come up with a really thoughtful question at the end um, based on either what you learned in the video or sorry based on what you learned in the um, the zoom video interview or uh, based on the research that you've done um, some other things that you might want to consider is uh, going back to taking notes so making sure that you answer the full question sometimes these questions get really long and it's hard to keep track in your mind of, especially if you've been doing several interviews, keep track of what you've said and what you haven't said. Make sure you jot it down and don't be afraid to ask people to repeat the question. Um, and again, use the full amount of time, but answer in a way that answers the questions um, that is succinct, but it's probably not a bad thing to add but it's definitely a bad thing not to add enough. So keep that in mind. Um, also, make sure you know the community that you'll be going into. So uh, depending on where the building is loca located or what kind of program it is, you're going to want to not only know the community culture of that building, but also the community culture in which that building is placed. And so you can look at different statistics from the city um, and look at maybe even the crime rate. You wouldn't want to put that in your interview, by the way. Don't put that in your interview. But it kind of gives you a general idea. If you've only worked in title buildings and you love working in a title building, you're going to want to say that in your interview because it takes a very special person to teach in a title building and we all know why. But make sure if you always have something to say because we have to address the negatives of teaching that you always put it in a way that sounds positive and affirming to the students in a way that values your families, your kids, and your coworkers. So um, no, none of the interviewees uh, that I've been a part of have said this, but don't label children as problems. Um, but you can also say that a child is a problem child in other ways, which I've probably heard instead of talking about how behavior is a way that we communicate what we need. And so if our needs are not being met, this is a way that students will um, communicate their need and it's our job to try to figure out what that is. Also, um, children do have an intrinsic desire to learn. <laughs> they do. Don't say they don't because they do. Children love to learn. They love to grow. They love your attention. So um, always come from that point of view when you're in an er interview. If there's a challenge for that student um, and you're speaking to a specific student example, talk about what worked talk about what didn't work and what kinds of support and collaboration that you needed in order to make that happen and be successful. Also, again, specific examples are probably the killer of most interviews and it's my number one pet peeve is if you can't relate this to your specific experience or how you would handle that specific experience and give examples, be specific, um, I'm probably not going to give you a very good score <laughs> because I want to know your personal style and philosophy as a teacher. So specific examples. Don't merely say that you like to collaborate. Everybody knows that you should like to collaborate and that's an important part of teaching. It's probably one of the most important things, but how do you plan on collaborating? give examples and don't merely just list them. Okay, you probably do want to list them so that we can write those down. But also, in addition, always have an example of how that is carried out in your classroom. If you haven't had your own classroom before, 
how will it look in your own classroom or how did it look in your student teaching experience? If this is your first time teaching, draw upon the life experiences that you have had that are applicable. Don't talk about maybe your job in uh, fast food or anything like that unless maybe you were a manager and there's some very creative way that you can pull that in. You're going to want to make it very specific to you being a teacher. So make it applicable, give very specific examples, or if you don't can't think of a specific example of a particular student at the time, think about the different things that you've handled with students on a whole. A lot of times there might be different patterns among students and different behaviors that you might see from year to year and what has worked and what hasn't worked, or you might have seen in your student teaching experience. Use a generalized um, explanation. Uh, principled a principal that we used to have used to always use these generalized examples and name that character Hank. To this day, that cracks me up. Hank, poor Hank, poor, poor Hank did everything. So um, if you have to make up a fictitious character to fit your needs, as long as you're not saying that this is an actual kid that you dealt with, but this is an example of the things that you have seen and that you've dealt with and the patterns and um, that kind of thing, then that's okay. You want to make, sh make sure it's uh, specific. Also, if you're a kindergarten teacher applying for a sixth grade position, your experience does still matter, but you need to find a way to talk about your experience in a way that applies to sixth grade. Don't always talk to your kindergarten experience because that'll probably lower your score because they're looking for someone who can handle sixth grade. Now, you might wanna draw the comparisons that, um, I've heard it said this way that sixth grade is very similar to kindergarten in the sense that they're just a little bit more articulate in sixth grade, but I know that the strategies are going to look a lot different. Uh, the differentiation is going to look different. The collaboration among the different classrooms is going to look different. Be specific. Again, specific. I feel like we need to underline that. Specific examples, okay? Again, less can't score you. More, we have more to draw from but also don't exhaust us and speak a mile a minute so that we can't understand what you're saying. Um, unless you're like the first interview of the day because by then, at least for me, my brain is mush and I can't remember everything that you said. <laughs> uh, another good rule of thumb that I didn't include on here um, is to give maybe about five second wait time because of different people's internet speed, especially when you're interviewing via Zoom. So giving people time to respond and to think. And if you need to think for a second, because some questions, especially when they're worded in a way to really draw upon a teacher's values, might take a minute for you to think about, just say, hmm, that is a really insightful question. Let me think about that for a minute. It's okay to have some quiet. Um, just make sure that you're not quiet for too long. And again, if you know your values as a teacher, if you know who you are as a teacher, if you know how you're going to respond in different situations and you've already worked through those things, maybe even written them down ahead of time, your ability to answer those questions will become a little bit more natural than they would if you just were completely caught off guard. And even all the preparation in the world, you can still be caught off guard because these questions um, that interview interviewers are asking are challenging and they are hard and they make me think as a teacher, oh my gosh, again, I wonder how I would answer that. So as a reflective teacher, um, it's a really good opportunity for me to think about can I articulate what I do in a way that is uh, a way that I can communicate to others? Because if I can't communicate it, then people don't really understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Oh, don't just merely list definitions. Okay, um, it kind of goes back to the acronym. You do want to define what the acronym is, but don't just merely list definitions of best practices make it personal to your interview and the job that you're seeking after. So don't merely just have definitions of building rapport with uh, families. Make sure that you incorporate that. Um, my background is in social work before I went into teaching, and so I might draw upon uh, some of the language I would use within there, but then I would define what those things are because a lot of these things parallel what I'm already doing in a school system. So don't just merely list definitions, make it personal. And again, be specific. Again, underline specific. Um, classroom management solutions. 
uh, making sure that you're talking about different tiers of support and what you would do for the different tiers of support. What would you do at tier one? What would you do at tier two? What would you do at tier three? Maybe being familiar with the different behavior modification strategies within that building or the district, such as PBIS. Um, and knowing that it's not a program, but it is a, it, it's a view and a strategy that we use to help kids be successful within a school system. Um, acknowledge the barriers that students have and address how you do your best to um, break through those barriers. And also talk about your own intrinsic um, values and maybe not specific examples, but maybe how the perspective that you have might be different than another child's perspective and how do you go about bridging the gap uh, both with yourself and a student or a family, especially when you might not mesh, but also amongst the students in your classroom. How do you build that community in a way that makes students feel safe? Um, to merely say you make students feel safe or that you make phone calls home or that you do um, like a inventory at the beginning is great, but give specific examples. Maybe an example of a student that you had a difficult time reaching until you realized, man, I just really needed to ask them some questions about their day. And I realized that this was bothering them at home and here's some of the strategies we came up with. Talk about parents being your partner um, and that you don't just reach out with the things that you wanna correct or the behaviors that uh, might seem negative to a family, but how do you breach having that rapport with families in a way that is positive and reaffirming to the families because a lot of times, especially in buildings that I work at, uh, families feel very um, almost embarrassed of their education sometimes or don't feel like they know enough um, to help their children. And so reminding parents that they have uh, the ability to help their kids that we could never do because their mom or dad or grandma, grandpa, or auntie, uncle um, that they are a child's first teacher and that they are great at what they're doing and they're doing a great job and bring out those positives, not just in kids, but parents. Um, they need that affirmation too. It's a hard world. It's, it's very hard when you're working as well as um, teaching your kids in a distance learning model, which brings me back to the distance learning and blended learning models. Um, again, don't merely just list the applications you use, maybe list a variety, but also talk about specifically how that would look in your classroom because teaching from a blended learning model um, is entirely different than our historical way of teaching and a workshop model. It's still able to be accomplished, but you might want to break it up in a way that makes sense for kids and families so that they can follow along. So you want to be specific about maybe what your day's uh, structure would look like. You might still want to include a visual schedule. How are you going to differentiate for kids with IEPs or language needs or kids who might be experiencing trauma secondhand because of the race issues that are going on in our society right now? How do you um, involve the global community around your kids in order to meet their needs? And internet is a huge way that you can do that. So be specific. Um, I teach kindergarten and I still use um, these applications in a way that is very purposeful. So make sure that it's purposeful and, and, and intentional when you're giving your explanations. Being intentional is a huge part of being teaching, um, being a teacher. Also, being showing that you care about your students and that you're excited and to smile is going to be huge. Um, I tend to be a little bit more even toned, whereas some people are really, really boisterous and very excited. Um, I tend to be a little bit more even. So showing your excitement and making sure that you're giving yourself that feedback that you need in a Zoom meeting is actually very valuable compared to in person. Because what I can do is if I'm watching myself on the screen, I'm instantly giving myself feedback and saying, oh man, I look a little bit flat, but even if you're giving an interview in person, look at the other people's reactions and how they're looking at you. Are they smiling back? Do they look responsive to what you're saying or do they look like they are just so tired? Now, if you're the last interview of the day, you could be totally nailing it and might go straight to the top of their list and they're still tired. But try to make uh, sure that you're paying attention to body language and how they're reacting 
um, and just remind yourself too that we can't always ask clarifying questions so it's going to be up to you to do that in an interview if it's not there we can't score it um, include your teaching philosophy within one of the questions that you've answered. You should be able to have your teaching philosophy as like a mission statement in about a sentence to three sentences and should be ready and off the tip of your tongue. It's kind of like uh, an advertisement. It's your own personal advertisement. Um, so be ready to put that and sneak that in even if it's not part of one of the interview questions because it depends on who your interviewer is and what the values are for that building. A lot of things are going to be similar. Some things will be different. So a lot of interview questions from the past had to do with assessment and data-driven dialogue. So you would really want to hit that heavy and talk about how you are a data-driven instructor and how do you do that? How do you collaborate? How do you share kids? How do you have intentional groupings? Not just intentional groupings based on ability, but maybe also behavior and um, how kids get along. Like there's certain groups of kids that you might not want to put together because they might not be able to um, work in that sort of uh, dynamic. So make sure again, specific and intentional. Um, again, collaboration is important. Talk about how you plan to collaborate. If collaboration is difficult doing in person, bring in the distance and blended learning model about how you plan to uh, collaborate or hope to collaborate with a future team or have in the past based on what's going on in COVID-19. Um, for instance, my team, we're a really close-knit group. Um, we didn't always naturally click together perfectly and it took us a while to get to know each other, but we're now very, very close and I love the team that I work with and it's going to be important that if we were ever to add a team member that they could fit within that group. So we would look for not only the professional qualities, but whether or not their personality would match that of the building and us as a cohesive group. We collaborate on everything. I mean, I think we might collaborate more than anybody in our building. We are constantly, but prior to COVID, we were constantly talking to each other in the hallway. We actually switched kids once a week um, so that a teacher could do assessment with an entire group of kids. We shared kids and had an all kindergarten recess once a week. Um, we would switch kids for ability groupings. We didn't always get to that the way that we wanted because kindergarten is a little tricky that way depending on the group of kids that you have. But I mean, collaboration was so much more than just collaborate. Um, and we really have each other's backs and we would also not make decisions independently, but we really focused on the dependence of being a team and making sure that we made decisions together, which was sometimes um, challenging, but also made us better as a team and also is better for our kids. And I can say that our families really loved the fact that we shared our kids and didn't just get to know our own kids, but kids across the grade level. So be very intentional in your uh, explanations and how you plan on carrying that out in the future or what you hope for. Um, try not to list negatives um, about things that you just don't want to see or um, try to always turn it to the positive. So think about it this way. When you're giving an example, um, you wouldn't tell a student don't run. Although quite honestly, sometimes it comes out of my mouth because I'm trying to get the kid to stop so that they don't trip and fall. But you might want to say, please walk. <laughs> so make sure that your examples follow the same sort of structure. Uh, making sure you try to take the way that might be seen as negative and turn it into a positive. Um, don't dismiss distance learning as merely saying it technology is important. Well, we know technology is important. Be specific in your examples. How do you use it? Not just the programs, but how do you use it in a way that is strategic in your classroom to help promote student success, collaboration, and rapport with family? Because not everyone has equitable resources, which is another thing that needs to be addressed. If there are not equitable resources, how do you plan to make the resources the most equitable that you can, such as providing paper materials, making phone calls, emails, but also being consistent in your communication? So be specific in how you plan to make your learning and your teaching equitable so that all students can access it, which also, also brings in the race and ethnicity piece. It's more than just bringing in um, 
books with people from different backgrounds, but also bringing in uh, people from different backgrounds that show kids that those uh, people in the books are from a place of leadership that they can grow up to be people that look like them people that don't look like them um, and facilitating those conversations um, can even be done in kindergarten in a way that is developmentally appropriate so be prepared to answer those questions because it's a very hot topic in our society but it's not something we can ignore it has to be explicitly taught and that's something I'm always looking for in an interview is not to just say that social emotional learning and teaching about race and culture and ethnicity is something separate or extra that we do, but it's something that needs to be explicitly taught inside the classroom. And you need to provide specific examples and structures about how you facilitate that, not just a one-time basis or a once a week, but how do you do that on a daily basis? So some things that you might want to talk about are morning meetings, um, and what do you do for conflict resolution between children? How do you de-escalate a situation? Um, not every battle is worth fighting um, if you're talking about behavior. So be specific. Again, the more you know about who you are as a teacher, the better you can answer those questions, which is why sometimes it's harder when you're a new teacher. But if you know who you are, you know the values that you have, or this isn't your first um, experience in education or you had parents who are educators, you might have a really good solid understanding of who you are. But I can also say that who you think you are today is, might change in the future because it definitely evolves as we continue to grow and learn. And the minute we stay stuck is the time that we stop growing, which means maybe it's time for us to retire. Just my personal view. Um, assessment. Assessment is huge because formative assessment drives instruction, right? And how do you use data-driven um, assessments and what does that look like at the grade level you're interviewing for so that you can provide not just equitable education for your students, but also differentiate. Again, don't just say you differentiate. That means nothing. Don't just say you scaffold. That means nothing. Don't provide the definitions of differentiation and scaffolding. All teachers know what that means. What they don't know is how do you do that in your classroom? Specific examples. Specific. And try to think of it as bullet points. I mean, when you're preparing for an interview, you might have pages and pages of notes, but at least if you write it down first, prior to your interview, it'll be in your head and it'll be in your remembrance when you need it. So make sure you know what you know that you know, okay? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you hold dear and what is important to you is going to come out and come forward when you're having that interview and you want to set your best foot forward. So blended learning is not the same thing as distance learning, which means you're going to address the structures differently. At least that's what I've found is that the way that I would do blended learning means that they still have some in-person instruction versus distance learning, which is completely off campus. So address the challenges of those, but mainly always have a solution to the challenge that you're going to present. So you don't want to say that there's not a challenge because then you seem like you might be naive. You want to address the challenges and then have your solution. And it might not be a perfect solution. You might not have the answer, um, we have no idea what school is going to look like in the fall, especially here in Washington. Who knows? But what we do know is that there's going to be some form of blended learning slash distance learning. So be prepared to answer, answer specific questions.